subtitle of my speech is a quote from, not Bosch yet, but from Confucius, who says, when lo words lose their meaning, people lose their freedom. And as the great migration of, uh, crisis unfolded before our eyes in 2015, my colleagues and I predicted a rapid and sharp erosion of free speech in Europe. Sadly, we were once again proven correct in our analysis. This accelerating repression of dissent was fueled by the necessity to squash any objections to the recent wave of refugees, so-called refugees, of course. However, the new totalitarianism had in fact been growing for a long time before that. What had, had been occasional legal harassment 10 years ago had become commonplace by 2015. And what was unthinkable in 2001, namely the conviction and imprisonment of s someone solely for his publicly stated opinions, was occurring with frightening regularity by 2015. And for the last two years, things have gotten even worse. More than 10 years ago, my good friend Fjordman described what was happening in Europe, and especially in Scandinavia. Long before Donald Trump had ever heard of the issue, Fjordman described the no-go zones in Malmö and other Swedish cities. He wrote about the firemen and police being attacked with paving stones whenever they entered Muslim-dominated domin areas. He told of the gang rapes of young white girls by Muslim immigrants. And he documented the persistent refusal of the authorities to address the issue or even to admit that it existed. My colleague Dimfna at the website Gates of Vienna dubbed Fjordman the dark prophet of Norway. And that is exactly what he turned out to be. Everything he predicted has come to pass. Various European societies are now, now verging on collapse thanks to the continued insanity of m mass immigration from Muslim countries. No-go zones have popped up all over Western Europe. In Britain, France, Belgium, the Netherlands, Germany, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, and not least my own country, Austria. The cost of this invasion, for that is indeed what it is, is so huge that even the mighty German economy is growing under the strain. There is a mass epidemic of rapes and sexual assaults in all those countries that have admitted large numbers, large numbers of migrants. More significantly, there is an alarming increase in the number of gang rapes, which are a particular horrific, particularly horrific form of cultural enrichment that has been brought in by the new Europeans. All known instances of gang rape are perpetrated by immigrants or their descendants. It is simply not a crime that Euro native Europeans go in for. Yet the powers that be in Western Europe refuse to acknowledge this appalling fact. Even worse, anyone who dares to discuss the issue in these terms risks being charged with hate speech, racism, discrimination, and incitement all those Orwellian crimes that have been devised to suppress truth-tellers and squash dissent. What Fjordman predicted in 2005 and 2006 is now occurring with depressing regularity. Yet he was reviled and driven into exile for what he said. Even today, long after the revelation of Breivik's true sympathies, the dark prophet of Norway is shunned as a neo-Nazi by right-thinking right Europeans. The response of the authorities to the Islamization of their countries and the destruction of their cultures is to make any frank discussion of it a crime. Fifteen years ago, no one was jailed for criticizing Islam or opposing mass immigration. Now it happens with depressing regularity and it's a virtual daily occurrence. Here is a brief overview of the milestones in the deterioration of free speech in Germany and Austria. 
First, the most important milestone was the European Union's 2008 framework decision on combating racism and xenophobia, which calls for, and I quote, each member state to take measures necessary to ensure that the following intentional conduct is punishable, end quote. Such intentional conduct includes, and again I quote, conduct which is a pretext for directing acts against a group or persons or a member of such group defined by race, reference to color, race, descent, or national or ethnic origin, end quote. In November of 2010, I warned an audience in Copenhagen, in Denmark, about this framework by saying the following, the death throes of free speech were beginning. Ever since, countless men and women all over Europe have been rounded up, prosecuted, and fined. Some have even spent time in jail, such as my friend Tommy Robinson. And just recently, a couple weeks ago, a German satirist was jailed for 20 months. His crime? Publishing political satire marked as such. Second, the German Federal Criminal Police Office has offered advice to German women on how they can protect themselves from rapists. And I quote, wear tennis shoes instead of high heels so you can run away, end quote. In other words, you may not protest against the state's immigration policies. You may not even discuss such policies in frank, factual terms, or we will prosecute you. And if you do happen to suffer from the effects of immigration, of mass immigration, we will do nothing to protect you. Hate speech laws have been updated, and that's the next point. They are even stricter now. Newly defined protected groups have been established, and I'll give you more detailed information on this later. Next point. In order to stop internet hate posts, the Austrian Minister of Justice is planning to hire six, can you believe it, six state prosecutors specifically for the prosecution of online hate. Dear friends, my country is in the process of falling apart. We are being bankrupted by the load of refugees that Angela Merkel has foisted upon us. Austrian women, girls, and even boys have, are being raped by these culture enrichers at an unprecedented rate. And the government spends its resources to suppress hate posts? Next point. In September of 2015, Angela Merkel said the following. When people, and I'm quoting her verbatim, when people stir up sedition on social networks using their real names, better watch out, Bosch, it is not only the state that has to act, but also Facebook as a company should do something against these statements, end quote. Mark Zuckerberg, the founder and CEO of Facebook, has happily obliged. Facebook, dear friends, is indeed cracking down on hate speech. Facebook users who say anything negative about Islam or publish posts criticizing immigration may not only expect that such posts be taken down, but that their accounts may well be deleted and that they will be denied the right to create any new ones. Moreover, private homes have been raided by police following Facebook posts criticizing mass immigration. Facebook and other supposedly private companies are doing the government's repressive work for them. Next point. German Justice Minister Heiko Maas has outsourced the state's crackdown on hate speech to the privately run Amadeo Antonio Foundation. The head of this foundation, you know the story, no? Uh, listen to this. The head of this foundation is a former communist from the DDR, East Germany, who used to be a Stasi agent. Her name is Aneta Kahane. 
Yes, you heard that right. Angela Merkel has outsourced the suppression of dissent in Germany to an agent for the Stasi. Next point. The same thing is happening in Austria. We have a Palestinian-born state secretary named Muna Dutstar. She has announced the creation of a reporting office for online hate speech not covered or addressed by the law. That is, the state is going to monitor what people say and crack down on hate, even if what they say is not against the law. Next point. It is criminal to bring attention to the problems created by the government's migration policies or to criticize it, because this constitutes hate speech. Moreover, firebombing a synagogue is simply an act of protest. So is calling Jews child murderers. And if a migrant, boy, a migrant man rapes a 10-year-old boy in a swimming pool, at a swimming pool, as, it hap as happened recently in Vienna, the important thing is to determine whether or not he understood that what he did was wrong and whether he thought the little boy had consented to the act. Oh. I haven't even gotten started yet. There's so much more. I'm not making this up. It really happened that way in my homeland, the country formerly known as Austria. No government should be allowed to decide what is worthy or unworthy of being published. It is much too easy to declare a story fake news because it doesn't serve one political interest or another. That is the method used by dictatorships. It is correctly described as authoritarian abuse. And all, unfortunately, authoritarian abuse has become the norm in much of Western Europe. Political correctness will have achieved its goal the day no one dares to answer the question, what does two plus two equal with four? Those who say four will be denounced for discriminating against five and for not being inclusive by leaving out all the other possible answers. Pedantic accuracy in calculation is, after all, inherently patriarchal and an expression of white privilege. In what, ladies and gentlemen, superficially appears to be the golden age of free speech, with more than a billion tweets, blogs, and Facebook posts a day, the politically correct dictatorship in Western culture has established two principles. The first, freedom of speech may be restricted at any time if some, someone claims that an opinion is an insult. Second, there is a vicious double standard. Minorities, especially Muslims, can freely say whatever they want against Jews and Christians, or women, or gays, or anyone at all, really. Being Muslim gives you a free pass to say whatever you want. A cordon sanitaire vis-a-vis -vis Islam has been created. As it stands, no one is brave enough to push the limits of what is still allowed to be uttered. The goal of any given conviction is to warn thousands of other would-be dissidents. Ladies and gentlemen, this is dictatorship, pure and simple. Any legitimate political opposition is now criminalized. Those who oppose the policies of the state are demonized, marginalized, and incarcerated as enemies of the system. It is also appalling that government ministers do not stand behind those who criticize Islam, but rather applaud their convictions in a court of law. Now comes your quote. Many of you here in this room, we all know Bosch Fosten. He is a very talented comic artist whose gra graphic novel, Pigment, confronted the ideology of Islam in a frank, courageous manner. His caricature of Mohammed won first prize at the Draw Mohammed competition held in Garland, Texas back in May of 2015. And you all know, we all remember what happened to interrupt that event. Two jihadists arrived with the intention of killing Pamela Geller, Robert Spencer, our friend Gerd Wilders, and Bosch, and anyone else who had participated. 
Had it not been for the timely and courageous act of one of the security guards, many people might have died that night at the hands of the great jihad. And I mentioned all this by way of introduction to a quote of yours. You wrote, political correctness was created by liars to wage war on the truth. As a result of that war on the truth, you have been driven into hiding after the events in Garland. And as Mark Stein said, there is no fine line between free speech and hate speech. Free speech is hate speech. It's for the speech you hate and for all your speech that the other guy hates. Suddenly the terrorist is no longer the person who guns down the innocent people in the street or blows them up in a cafe, but the person who articulates criticism. Those who wield the knives and the guns and the bombs are not considered responsible for their behavior. Those who write and speak their thoughts are deemed responsible for all the violence. In other words, I'm not the terrorist, you made me do it. The modern politically correct state is in tune with this so-called logic. The violent immigrants it has invited into its territory are never at fault. Only the natives can be responsible. It is their fault that the newcomers steal and rape and murder. The natives failed to welcome the migrants. They did not show sufficient tolerance. They failed to be inclusive. And so on and so forth ad nauseum. In the modern multicultural state, the dictatorship of political correctness has all the weapons. It points a loaded gun at its citizens and forces people to speak only what it likes to hear. Every now and then, a critic is dealt with prominently in public to serve as an example so that everybody else knows what will happen if they cross the line into unacceptable opinions. Divergent opinions are sanctioned more severely than any criminal behavior. Expressing an unacceptable opinion may earn you a harsher sentence than theft or assault or robbery or rape. Violent crime does not threaten the all-pervasive power of the state as much as dissent does. So the dissident merits a harsher sentence. And he's sanctioned not through discussion or refutation or argument, but through exclusion. He is cut off from all the benefits and perquisites that the state has to offer. And under the modern socialist state, this is as effective as a sentence of death. Stigmatization, or what Hillary called so tellingly labeled shunning and shaming, has been converted into a sharp weapon. It is no longer important what one says, but rather who one is. Ironically, the isolation of po political adversaries also isolates their accusers. They are no longer challenged because no one wants to be called a fascist or a racist or a hater or an Islamophobe. And because everyone remains silent out of fear, their accusers believe they are the majority. Those in power are insulated from the opinions of the people they so cavalierly control, so that they have no idea how much they are loathed, feared, and resented. They end up believing their own opinion polls. They think that the average citizen really does approve of their multicultural one world dream. However, as the Brexit referendum and the election of Donald Trump so clearly showed, both of them, right? We applaud both, Brexit and Donald Trump. The great unwashed don't always hold the opinions they're supposed to. Oh yes, they'll say what's expected of them, and when the pollster phones, they'll give the answers that are expected of them. But when they enter the privacy of the voting booth, it's a whole different matter. We live in a time of rude awakening for all those who thought they had the peons under their firm control. 
in order to enforce the party line now, they'll have to ab abandon all pretense of democracy and go full Soviet on us. We, the people, have turned out to have more of a mind of our own that they gave us credit for. We hold unauthorized opinions and we're even proud of it. How dare we? Ladies and gentlemen, those who proclaim hate, hatred being a very basic human emotion, live in a state of indifference. If you do not feel outrage at what is place, taking place today, such as FGM, or child marriage, or polygamy, or decapitation, you have already given up on hu your humanity. These barbarisms are even occurring in the enlightened West. When a Muslim immigrant arrives in Sweden with a 14-year-old pregnant wife, the authorities are incapable of taking action. If a native Swede were to engage in such monstrosities, he would be prosecuted and imprisoned. But when a new Swede does it, why we have to be understanding? We have to respect cultural differences. And above all, we must never, ever be judgmental. We have exalted tolerance into a virtue that defies all reason. We are tolerating ourselves to death. We will tolerate anything except, of course, our own culture, our own values, and our own way of life. There is something inherently wrong with us if we pride ourselves in limiting freedom of speech instead of being proud of freedom. There is something rotten within us if we tighten criminal codes to harass dissidents rather than intensifying the debate. What has happened to us? Have we forgotten the vehemence with which we once opposed the gulag? Have we forgotten the memory of Alexander Solzhenitsyn? Has this memory faded out completely? What became of our championing of the famous Maxime attributed to Voltaire. We all know it, right? I do not agree with what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. And you may be asking yourselves, why do people in Germany and Austria not protest the true scope of the ongoing influx of migrants and its e effects on the native population? I submit to you that there are two reasons. The first was posited by a German, I think, political scientist named uh, Elizabeth Noel Neumann. You know her? Never heard of her? Very interesting lady. She said, she talked about the following, and it's called the spiral of silence. She says, individuals have a fear of isolation that results from the idea that a social group or society in general might isolate or exclude them due to the members' plural opinion, opinions. This fear of isolation consequently leads to their remaining silent instead of voicing their opinions honestly and openly. You see, people feel more comfortable when they agree with opinions they know are wrong instead of telling others their own contrarian ideas. In light, of, in light of this theory, I consider myself and my colleagues hardcore nonconformists. That is, we're people who have already been rejected for our beliefs and have nothing left to lose by speaking out. It is our duty to help reconfigure majority opinion, which in this case is the opinion created, transported, and disseminated by the media. People are not so much afraid of having the wrong opinion currently, but of having it on their own. Such intolerance nowadays does not, social intolerance nowadays, does not cause physical harm. But if you have the wrong opinion, you are pressured to mask it or keep silent. Any dissenting opinions are not criticized, but hated. The second reason why people in Germany and Austria do not rise up against this insanity is that the mainstream media do not report the actual extent of the migration problem. 
And this is particular in Germany. It's getting a little bit better in, in Austria. The extent of the problems is suppressed by the so-called code of media ethics, ethics, which restricts the information journalists may use in their stories. In effect, censorship has become a national security problem. By limiting what the populace may know and become aware of, the media are actually putting the populace in danger. Here are a few examples of the way the current madness plays out in Europe. First, there are strict instructions from the top down not to report sexual offenses committed by immigrant refugees. Coercive methods are used to suppress any speech that opposes immigration. If a migrant story, if a sto sorry, if a story about a migrant atrocity is to be reported at all, it must be considered local news only and kept out of the national media. The ethnicity of the perpetrators and any abominations is to be hidden at all costs, unless, of course, the offenders are native Europeans, in which case their ethnic background is cause for front page headlines. Second, the unelected European Commission has unveiled a code of conduct to ensure that online platforms do not offer opportunities for illegal, quoting, illegal online hate speech to spread virally, end quote. The European Commission will determine what constitutes illegal online hate speech. The people's elected representatives will have no say in the matter. Third, the European Parliament is considering a measure that would cut off the microphone on anyone who expresses hateful right-wing opinions and would expunge their words from the parliamentary record. <laughs> According to the American political scientist Paul Edward Gottfried, there are three ways in which today's regimes are now engaged in managing consensus. The first is for political and media setters to stress that agreement has already been reached on a certain topic. For example, over immigration programs. Therefore, those who oppose the policies now agreed upon have either missed the debate or are stirring up needless controversy. Mm -hmm. Secondly, by harping on the real or imagined evils of the past, Germany, proponents of the state-controlled socialization appeal to the guilty conscience of their listeners, end quote. Mm -hmm. And lastly, again I quote him, those who disagree with the policy of making us more diverse or ac to accommodate the marginalized are prejudiced and therefore sick. Their sickness requires treatment by professionals whom the state certifies and by sensitive judges who understand the effect of hate speech." End quote. The old psychiatric hospitals and so did you exactly. Now gets worse. Watch this in action. First the theory, now we get to the... Thank you. Watch this in action at the European Council of Tolerance and Reconciliation, which aims to fo force tolerance on Europeans. Under its proposed framework, dissidents are at the mercy of these preachers and enforcers of tolerance. I quote, Juveniles convicted of committing crimes listed in paragraph A will be required to undergo a rehabilitation program designed to instill in them a culture of tolerance, end quote. This is truly frightening. Ladies and gentlemen, a, true, a free society cannot prescribe the toleration of the intolerant. Actual tolerance requires free citizens to tolerate the views they dislike. It insists that they accept the existence of opinions they don't agree with, views that make them uncomfortable, that they consider abhorrent, 
opinions, dare I say it, that they hate. There is no free speech in any meaningful sense if I am not confronted every single day with words that infuriate me or dismay me or fill me with loathing. In an enlightened and truly tolerant society, every citizen would understand that when he is confronted with opinions he does not like, he may close the book, turn off the TV, walk out of the room, nobody's walking, okay, uh, walk out of the room or, you know, just click off the web page, right? But under a modern multicultural regime, unpleasant opinions are made illegal. People who hold such opinions are labeled fascists. They are fired from their jobs. If they are spotted on the street, mobs of anti-fascists will pelt them with bottles and rocks. In Germany and in Austria. This is what tolerance consists of in the 20th, 21st century, in the West of the 21st century. Under government enforced tolerance, extremists would flourish, honest critics would be silenced, freedom of expression would be criminalized, and in deference to religious and cultural groups, the individual would lose his right to be an individual. Wait, isn't all of this happening already? Multicultural ideology classifies people primarily as members of, a, of religious or cultural groups, not as individual citizens with individual rights. People no longer have any individuality. They are only black or white or male or female or gay or lesbian. Collective identity has trumped everything else. Classical liberal law is designed to protect the individual against oppressive interest groups. Under the proposed EU framework that I mentioned above, group libel means, and I quote, defamatory comments with a view to slandering the group or holding it to ridicule, end quote. The government and or the interest groups naturally define these groups. And this is already reality in Europe. And if Hillary Clinton had become president here in the US, it would have become your reality too. We all seem to have become information warriors in a jungle of words. Okay. It becomes harder and harder to tell fact from fiction. If we start identifying as fake news any statements we find ideologically disagreeable or that come from a political opponent. Therefore, it is important to call a piece of information fake only when it is really fake, that is, provably false non-news. We should not label all political positions we disagree with as fake news. Banning unpleasant speech is a slippery slope. Who, after all, has the right to tell us when exaggeration or ideological bias is damaging enough for the speech to be classified as criminal? Quis custodiet ipsos custodet? Who will guard the guardians? I propose the best protection against ideological bias and bad style is an alert, critical consumer with a strong sense of media literacy and full access to information of every sort. The Finnish dissident Livi Anamaso said, I quote her, without our own first amendment in Europe, reference to fake news, hate speech and info wars can increasingly be used as a means to silence those whose speech the powers that might be might be tempted to stifle for reasons other than the sincere pursuit of truth, end quote. And I'll close tonight with a quote from the so former Soviet dissident Oleg Adbashian, who runs a marvelous satirical website called The People's Cube. He describes perfectly why I do what I do. He says, I hate politics as much as a soldier hates the war. 
but continues to fight because it's the only way to victory. I'd rather live my life enjoying beautiful things without any politics attached. But today that seems like an impossible dream. The alternative to fighting is a surrender to the stifling totalitarianism and censorship, which will be a lot worse than going back to the Soviet days. The West's surrender to the leftist and Islamist agenda, Islamic agenda, means that there will be no other parts of the world left to give us the hope of freedom. Nowhere to smuggle uncensored books or tapes or cartoons from. Nowhere to run to, end quote. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, America must remain a place to run to. It must remain a place for those uncensored books, the politically incorrect speech, and for genuine freedom of speech. As for me, I don't think you're going to be surprised, but I will never, ever surrender, and I will continue to speak out. And I sincerely hope you will do the same, all of you. Our children depend on us, and I believe we must not let them down. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.